So good morning, everyone. Welcome to March the 8th weekly Conquer the Clutter podcast. You're going to have to bear with me uh, today. My computer is acting up. I can't get it, uh, the mouse or the uh, down button uh, to do anything other than jump. So I'm going to be managing, uh, and I am not a techno wizard. Uh, so uh, the first thing I guess I want to tell you is um, things are moving forward um, with the um, uh, neonatal CPAP project. Um, and here we go. Didn't I tell you? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And um, we will be talking um, as we move forward um, about adverse childhood experiences as they relate to how they might have developed after our early years. So the first thing I want to tell you is, and uh, Hafs is going to screen share um, a visual art piece that Braden created. Um, the reason I would like her to do that is that if you see this on social media or you happen to be um, at hoarding.ca for some reason and you see this, I want you to um, recognize it and see it for what it is. Hafsa, can you screen share um, Braden's promo uh, visual art? Did I lose Hafsa? Oh no, there we are. Oh, okay, good. This is um, the piece that you will see on social media. It's on my personal Facebook. It's on Virtual Consulting Facebook. It's on Instagram. It's on, we didn't put it on LinkedIn because we thought it was inappropriate for business uh, purposes, like business to business. Um, it, you may get um, a copy in your inbox from um, the, um, get response list, which is the same list that uh, your invitation comes through. So if you get it more than once, we're not poking you. It's just that you happen to be on more than one uh, outreach. And it goes into the background. It shows you what the current uh, equipment is, all depending on that little plastic bottle. Um, it shows you the equipment that we will be purchasing. We're hoping to get three. Um, it shows you a little bit about uh, Bowindi Hospital. And very soon, um, we're going to have a video on hoarding.ca so that people can go and just see exactly uh, what these people are accomplishing uh, for the wider community with the little bit they have. We do talk a little bit about, there's a QR code in the bottom. Um, you can use that QR code that will connect you to PayPal. If there's any way possible that if you are of a mind, don't mean to press, but if you are of a mind to donate whatever amount, um, doesn't matter, um, every $5 counts. Um, the uh, If it's possible to do it by e-transfer, um, that was better because it avoids a lot of fees. PayPal um, within a country, so in Canada, Canadian contributions to Canadian bank accounts, um, it's 2.9% plus 30 cents on every transaction. And that was the cheapest platform that we could find that was reputable. All right. If it's international, if you're coming to me from the United States and you're of a mind to contribute, it's 3.9%. All right. Plus, and I'm not sure that there aren't exchange rates. So, oh, my goodness. Um, and 30 cents per transaction. So um, all of the money that comes in, if you e-transfer it to elaine.virtualadhoarding.ca, it's going to be put directly into the Bowindi CPAP machine fundraiser account that we have opened specifically for that. It's not going to be mixed in. Nobody's going to make a mistake. And you have my word that every single cent is going to go to purchasing that equipment and whatever other supplies they don't have that would be useful. 
Um, okay, so um, let's move forward. Um, all right. The other thing I want to tell you is I had an interesting day yesterday. Um, I thought it wasn't possible that something very novel uh, would happen. I was asked to be, and, and I accepted, being a subject area expert opinion at a human rights tribunal, um, an Ontario human rights tribunal. Not sure it isn't Canadian, actually. Um, as a subject area expert on hoarding, as it relates specifically to residential issues. Um, and so I learned a lot about the process for sure uh, and was really happy. Um, I came away feeling pretty chuffed that um, good information was more, it was a subject area expert opinion they asked on a number of issues related to housing. Um, but the vice chair was so open and to learning and being informed that a good part of my opinion was allowed to be basically a psychoeducational uh, piece. So uh, somebody who has the power to make more informed decisions now has best source information um, around hoarding. Um, so I slept a little better last night knowing that the world can be a fairer place and, and made the point very, very clearly that hoarding is not bad housekeeping, all right? Nothing to do with that. And that actually some people um, who hoard, who I ha have worked with, have a neater house than I do and a cleaner house. We have two dogs, what can I tell you? Um, and people who don't always take their boots off. Life and life goes on. However, um, then um, I want to talk to you a little bit also about um, the, um, I guess we're going to call it a workshop um, that we talked about last week. We had 20 people express interest, which is very gratifying. Um, now, remember, um, let me take it in order. Um, the date is going to be Sunday, March 26th, because that's the first and only Sunday I have available. There's no other time during the week. I know that one or two people said morning was best for them, but it wasn't best for everyone else. And it works a whole lot better for me to be able to be available. Um, it's going to be from 1 until 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Adjust accordingly if you're in another time zone. Um, remember, the cost, the fee you pay for that workshop, it isn't free, you set. And there is no amount that is too low to be embarrassed by because every single cent is going to go to this fund. All right. So you set it. Don't be embarrassed if you are on a budget at all. Any fee that you think you can manage um, is acceptable. All right. However, you have to register. It's not a drop in. You have to register. And you register by sending an expression of intent to elaine.birchall at hoarding.ca. Yes, I am interested for the workshop March 26th from 1 till 4. All right. And uh, that needs to be received by, let me just cue myself here. Braden's going to have a little bit of editing to do. Um, has to be, you have to register by March 15th. That's next Wednesday. All right. And if you register, you must attend because there will be, I will accept all invitation, all uh, registration, but at a certain point, the numbers are going to dictate whether we can do things like breakout into small breakout groups and that kind of thing. It will directly affect how I will organize it. But I think there is a merit, even if it's more like a podcast, I think that there is a merit to um, as many people getting the opportunity to begin their processing, all right? And some of this material as well might be, is likely to be um, 
a beginning piece for the workshops that are coming in April um, that I've talked about. All right. So the other thing, too, is the fees, whatever they are, again, don't be embarrassed if they're low. That's not a problem. Um, have to be paid by the end of Saturday, March the 18th. I can't be organizing and getting the final touches on a workshop that's that important to people. At the same time, I'm handling administrative things. And there's only so many things that half second balls half second keep in the air. So 15th for registration, 18th by whatever the fee is that you're good with. All right. And there's no need to be embarrassed, no matter how much or how little it is. It's all good. All right. Um, now, let me see. Yeah. If you can pay by, there are a number of ways to pay. If you can pay by e-transfer, all the better. Um, however, if you're coming in from the States and um, you don't need PayPal because you're going to be using a credit card or something like that, um, sending me a check as well, all right, to, um, and I'll give you the address. Um, it's number one, Domus, D-O-M-U-S, Crescent, Ottawa, O-T-T-A-W-A, -T -T Ontario, K-2-H-6-A-3. All right. So if there's any way possible not to use PayPal, that's better for the long term uh, benefit. All right. If you have to use PayPal, well, then you have to do what you have to do. All right. So um, yeah, I talked about the percentages. They're ghastly. Um, that are conversion fees. All right, so let's start um, dealing with the material for today. Um, and we're going to cover as much as we can, and we will conclude next week. We're not going to go on talking endlessly about adverse childhood experiences, because there probably will be a workshop, a, a broader workshop um, on that, and there definitely will be the mini one. All right, so the topic today, we've talked about early years, you know, almost uh, from birth, pre-verbal, when uh, we as little mites were basically sensory beings, all right? Now we're talking about what those adverse childhood experiences can be and how they can affect us after the earliest years. What is the effect on us? So we're talking about, that would start about age three, four, all right? So both sides, you have to know, we've talked a lot about brain formation, a lot about brain chemistry, but both sides of the brain by three and four years of age are now sufficiently online, all right? And developed and functional that further affects of adverse childhood experiences, such as putting the pieces together and your conclusion about yourself is low self-esteem. Or as, as is so common, and I made that point clear yesterday, shame, all right? Shame and fear, fear about being discovered Fear about people knowing the truth about you as though you're the only person in the world who is flawed and imperfect. Fallible has made big, medium, and serious mistakes in your life. And yet, look at yourself in the mirror. You're still standing. All right? And you're still looking for ways to be the person you know you are. That's why you come here every week. Right? So put that on the scale. If we touch anything that makes you feel a little jittery, all right. But by age three and four, moving forward, the more remember what you habituate, all right, is what you limit yourself to. 
because what you habituate, habituate just means you do the most, whether you want to do it, you mean to do it, you even believe it. If it's where you go first, you're habituating something. Remember that that is, that can become your default. Just because it's your default doesn't mean it's true. You can have a default belief about yourself that limits you. You've heard of limiting beliefs. You can have a default belief about yourself that is ingrained and becomes implicitly or explicitly the example of how you live, all right? So if you were in an environment where a parent or parents, all right, were harshly critical, all right, harshly critical, high expectations and anything less than that, no matter how well-meaning well it was, you know, they may have been told the way for children to be a success, independent, happy, was to set high standards rather than develop the child, tell the child the truth and work from the truth. Whatever was well-intentioned or mal-intentioned on the part of parents, however guided or misguided they were, all right, what they said and what they said the most, how they behaved about you can become imprinted, right? Can become imprinted. And we are these little absorbent beings by the age of three and four and moving forward, all right? So when it gets imprinted, it means that it was probably outwardly reinforced, but here's the trick. At what point, if you did, did you start to reinforce it from inside, right? And know that every time, I want you to think of it as blocks, building blocks. So you have an experience of blame, criticism, harshness, rigid rules, rigid standards, that's external, and you're absorbing that. But every time moving forward, including till today, that you give credence, you go there, you stay there too long, you add to it. What happens is you are building the strength of that faulty belief that limiting belief. So if, for instance, you had a little bit of damaged self-esteem as a child because you weren't the smartest kid in the family, you weren't the favorite, you were something, who knows what parents decided to focus on, all right? When they did that, they didn't really know who you were. They were responding to their own needs for you to be safe, healthy, a success in their eyes, they didn't listen long enough to realize who this little being was. And maybe they squashed, all right, some of the positive things about you that didn't look so great at 3, 4, 10, 11, 15, because they were still parts of you that were in the making, all right? You need to back up from that, all right, because Whatever you reinforce, even if it's not true, even if it's not positive, and even if it's not helpful, becomes the first place you go. And you can waste an awful lot of time reverting to false limiting beliefs about yourself. All right. So low self-esteem or damaged um, Self-esteem is, is a very common one. The sec second topic I want to talk about on this continuum, occurring quite often in the earlier years of life, is at some point, um, we develop a sense of shame, a sense of it. Now, I'm not saying a sense of it for ourselves, And quite often, 
depending on the period um, of your parents' uh, development themselves and their family of origin issues, it may have been a place they went to to correct you, all right? Evidence in fact, have you ever known people who are intelligent, they're pleasant, they're attractive enough, even successful in the world's eyes, who in, tell you or you pick up that they intensely dislike themselves, they intensely disapprove of themselves? Hmm? Shame helps to explain this. Somewhere they've got a deep grain of shame that they are not letting go of. They are not processing. They are not seeing in the true light of day. And that shame fills them. It, 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 it has become building block after building block because they habituated, not because it was true then, not because it's warranted or true now. All right. Shame is closely related to insecure attachment. And it's also closely related to low self-esteem. If you were shamed or you had to watch the effects of other people being shamed, that can also have a very detrimental effect. All right, maybe you didn't get shamed. Maybe you had a brother or a sister who got shamed, all right? And you had to witness that. Don't think you didn't learn from that, all right? And what most of us would learn from that, what, what would be very normal to learn from that is, I will do anything, I will do anything other than to get in that lineup, all right? Like, what do I have to do to avoid? Because if it can happen to them, it can happen to me, all right? Nobody's exempt. What diversionary tactics, if that was happening, not trying to talk you into it, all right? If that to some degree was happening, what diversionary tactics did you take to avoid being the next one in line or the next object that that behavior got applied to? What did you do? And are you still doing it to some degree? Has this become some kind of way to process your best strategy, your best approach to a challenge? All right. So let's clarify. Shame differs from guilt. The logical mind accepts appropriate guilt. I did this. That was the effect. Not so good. All right. If I had it to do over again, wouldn't handle it that way. Maybe somebody got a little hurt. Maybe a little damage was done. Maybe a relationship was, was uh, impaired as a result of it. Guilt. I, I own. Guilt is not necessarily um, a negative thing. Guilt is kind of a, a word that can, if you don't overdo it, we're not talking about flogging here uh, or self-flogging, all right? Living with it, reminding yourself, chewing on it. No, guilt is simply meant to be a reaction when you take full responsibility for your part in something that turned out negatively and probably impacted someone else or a situation, right? It acknowledges when we've done something wrong, that is very important. Feeling good about yourself isn't always about, I did the right thing and I'm a shining star. Feeling good about yourself sometimes can be, uh, I took responsibility for something that fill in the blank. And, you know, I will do, I will do my best to do better next time because I've made myself learn from that experience. Okay. And guilt 
motivates us to take appropriate corrective action, if I can make it up to the other person, if I can remedy the situation, I have a responsibility and I take that responsibility. I don't make excuses for myself. All right. I take responsibility and I step up for, for the other, the situation or another person, but also for my own self-respect. Because even if I could get away with it, that's not the right thing to do. Guilt, my sense of, of ownership, my sense of personal responsibility means this is on me to do the best I can to correct or remedy. However, the logical mind in the three, four moving up ages isn't fully developed in the early years, all right? In the later years of childhood, toxic stress can take the logical mind offline in the later years. Imagine when you get to be a teenager, you are not hormonally the same person, one 10 minutes to the next, all right? Imagine that the opportunities for creating things that you're guilt, you should feel guilty about, you should experience guilt about. And if the way to process guilt is shame, to shame yourself, all right? To bring that home, to wear it like a cloth coat, to let it seep into you. They, oh, I remember when I did that. And oh, hey, put it down. It's too heavy. It probably isn't true now. And if there's something that is true in that vein right now, take out your pen and paper and make a note of it. Now, write it down. All right. And after the podcast, come back to it and say, what reasonably can I do? to rectify this, even if it doesn't late to correct it for the other person, to make it right so that I can have a free, clear conscience. Okay. So a little later on in life, teenagehood is a good example, all right? Our brain isn't necessarily concerned with logic. All right. And sometimes when we feel rightly or wrongly, accurately or inaccurately, that survival is at stake, that can, it's a very powerful experience, that can feel like a door opening for shame to take root because it's been lurking there in the background. Huh? It's been lurking there. Shame, let's make no mistake about this. It's not just the moment you feel it. You feel it wash over you and we have all done that. And we have all done things that it's not surprising that there is a, an experience of shame. But shame, if you hold on to it, or if you don't process it, if you don't try to make it good, whatever the situation, pay your dues is a sense of feeling bad about yourself right to the core. And when it sits there, it sort of percolates, all right? It percolates and it's a little like mold, frankly, all right? It grows, it occupies, and it becomes self-loathing or self-contempt. I'm not talking about every second of every day, but I'm saying that you, the next time you don't, you're not a shining star, you now have an environment lurking in the background of your subconscious that has an unnecessary, unhealthy degree of self-sabotage. Why would you succeed? Why would you expect to be treated with dignity and respect and compassion? Well, behind that door, you've got mold growing in the form of 
something that when the door opens and you get a whiff of it, because there's something in the current circumstance that is triggering it, you have a healthy dose of self-loathing and self-contempt. And that can take your breath away. All right, that can take the wind out of your sails. Shame can be imprinted implicitly on the right brain. And when it gets imprinted on the right side of the brain, it becomes a part of a sense of yourself. And it's not just a sense of it. The problem with that part of the brain is it also is evocative. It becomes a felt sense as well. So you're not just experiencing it intellectually, intellectually or cognitively. You're feeling it in the fiber of your being. Your stomach is clenched. You get a wash like you've just been hit with a pail of cold water. All right. Emotion. You feel like you're burning up emotions and bodily perceptions that mimic whatever caused that in the first place are more likely to set off a chain of reactions cognitive intellectually cognitively and at a sensory level as well all right and if you don't get a handle on that this will be a hiccup or a tripping point that can result in repeated attachment disruptions. As you're forming and maintaining relationships, you're going to encounter some experiences that mimic or are similar to whatever this hiccup was that caused this implicit or explicit shame. Or maybe you were shamed, all right? You're not getting through life without similar experiences. It's people who look the same, who have the same voice, who say the same words, who create the same power struggle, who whatever you're sensitive to. All right. And if you don't shine the light of day on it and we don't work on that. Repeat, 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 repeat until you wake up is your likeliest response, all right? And remember, this all started back from the first to the 18th month of life is when that secure attachment opportunity or insecure attachment opportunity, those are the foundation pieces. You can't go back and clear up when you were one month or eight to 18 months. But we can do remedial work now. For example, I'll show you how this plays out in that one to 18 month. An infant might internalize neglect, all right? An impatient, an exhausted, a neglectful caregiver. Remember, that caregiver responding in a, in a positive way doesn't have to be a warm fuzzy all the time. Nobody's perfect. All right. But they are picked up. They are reassured. Remember, their basic survival instinct is attached to did is this person coming? They don't know the difference. We didn't know the difference between life and death at that age. It was all life or death. That's why their response was so important. We were susceptible to nonverbal messages. How were we picked up? How were we pouted? How were we jiggled to quietness down? All right. All of these are interpreted at a sensory level. Can you go back and change that? No, but you can reinterpret it. You can add because now you have both sides of your brain. Now you can distinguish. Now you can balance, right? All right, those messages at some level conveyed, I'm not safe, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not important, I'm not worthy. Did you have a word to put to it? No, it was all in a sensory way. This did not register, this registered. 
when you feel those ways now, and we all, we all feel those ways at some point in time. Okay, that's just life. When you feel those ways, where do you feel it? How do you feel it? That is really important because that is one of the key ways in order to regain self-control, self-habituation, self-care, to realize before I repeat, 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 repeat the action, the attitude, the whatever I will regret, all right? I feel it somewhere. It registers somewhere. Are you aware of where it registers? And quite often, I ask the people I work with directly. Let's track it back. So you're aware of it when your neck hurts. You're aware of it when your stomach clenches. You're aware of it when you feel like you have just been hit by a fireball. All right. Or you feel cold. All What's your reaction? Let's track it back. Okay, that's when you're aware of it right now. Now, let's track it back to the spot just before that. Just before that. Just before that. So that I can get you back to having a much more, much fuller sensory experience of your own processing pattern. And you can catch it when it's just a little bubble. When it's just a little bubble, these feelings of shame and guilt and whatever, all right? I'm not important. I'm not worthy. I don't matter. Okay, I'm a screw up there. I did it again. What's the message? What's the message you're sending to yourself when you're not your, when you're not a star? All right. And you find that catching it right there, you can turn it around. You can turn that message around. You can bring the adult that you are to the table to talk to that child. And I strongly encourage you to find the two parts of yourself, the child who is still carrying parts of that legacy and the adult that you are developing into today, who you didn't know as well yesterday and sit at a table and talk to one another. Yourself today and that little part of you. All right. Help that child understand. Mommy was having a bad day. You're a darling. All right. Undo the message. And it's not just mommy's. Okay. So realistic guilt, however, taking, and when I say realistic guilt, I'm talking about ownership. I'm talking, and not for the whole schmear. We are usually not so important that we are responsible for the whole schmear that goes wrong. All right. But the part we played. Mm. Yeah, I own that. Go back and rectify it as best you can. Starting with the most recent event. You do it for the other person, but you do it for yourself, too, because a chunk of shame, a chunk of lack of self-respect. Uh, uh, uh. You feel badly. You feel it. You feel it when you know you were unfair, when the light dawns and you go, oh, the other day, for instance, all right, don't ever wake me when I'm asleep is all I have to say, okay, because I am not a happy person. And the other day, somebody called, it was a family member, and I had just fallen asleep and I was so tired and I picked up the phone. I was in Mississauga and first of all, a phone call from home, all right, is a very unusual thing at 1030 at night. I'm in bed by 9, 830 if I can manage to crawl away that early. And the phone rang. So I had two startles. I had the, who's calling now? And then I had the, it's home what's wrong 10 30 at night wash fear dread because I've had more than a little bit of bad news in the last year and a half and so I set myself up reacting we do it all right and 
I picked up the phone and the person said, hi, how are you doing? And I thought, and all I could think to say was, it's 1030. And, <laughs> but I didn't say it that nicely. There was a little bit of a sharpness in my voice. And he said, oh, I said, yeah. Is it anything important? Get cut to the chase, bottom line girl. And they said, well, I just wanted to see how your day went. I said, yeah, okay, can we talk about this tomorrow? And yeah, yeah, sure. And I put it down. Guess who carried the load for that for the next three days until I got home? Uh, they felt a little smacked. All right. But I, I did a little struggle with myself. Well, you know, I called 1030 and we were all set to justify ourselves. However, you know what? Own it. You were a crabby person. And that person, even if they did something, that's not your best response. How are you going to resolve anything if you do that? All right. So when I got home, I said, oh, by the way, I'm really sorry for being crabby. And the person said, well, thanks very much because I did. <laughs> I did wonder. Do you see how we can trip over? When I reached out, which is what I'm trying to encourage you to do, there's benefit for you too. It's not just that you're supplicating yourself to someone else. There's a benefit to you too. You actually have more self-regard and more self-respect. I felt like that little burden of, of regret and I shouldn't have done that. That wasn't nice. That was entirely unnecessary. And how many times did I say to myself over those three days, that was entirely unnecessary. All right. There is a world that happens at 1030 at 90 lane. You're just not part of it. All right. But you don't bite somebody's head off because I did a whole schmear. So working up. So when I offered that, I'm really sorry. You know, right? I'm really sorry that. And I I got the response I got. <clears throat> there's a benefit to you as well. You will, you will think more of yourself. You will carry yourself with more self-respect and less regret. Aim, however, is a part of your felt sense. And while I wasn't ashamed of it, I regretted it. It plays out in many, many ways. All right. All of which will overlap with any relationship you have where there is less than secure attachment. That will play out, that shame will play out in some way, some proportion with insecure attachment. Don't you think you've carried it long enough? If this started at a sensory level, pre-verbal level, way back, all right? And if you can't think of a period in your life where something so extreme happened that you went from being one type of person to another type of person, there wasn't a rupture. Now, that can happen. And then the world moving forward can feel very different. All right. If that didn't happen, your best odds are that this is something that has creeped forward with you from early on and was either reinforced by the attitudes and behaviors and parenting approaches of your parents or it continued to be reinforced in some way until you picked up the baggage and now you're carrying it on your back now because nobody else is doing it. Your parents can't do it anymore. All right, so don't let them do it in incognito, all right? If they're doing it incognito, I have news for you. They're not doing it. You're doing it to yourself. And there are ways to undo that and remedy and heal that. All right. <clears throat> so what are you resistant to? Hmm? To what degree do you carry a little bit of self-loathing, a little bit of less than 
You have to kind of reinforce your self-respect. You have to remind yourself, I'm capable. You have to give yourself a cheer to get started or to get over a hump. It's not just a natural progression for you. What are you resistant to? What in your life is right out there in front of you? Maybe not 100% available, but certainly at some level with work, <clears throat> excuse me, doable. What about your career, if you're still working? What about family issues? What about your home and the way you want to live in it? Huh? Your home is the outward manifestation of the way you feel inside yourself. All right? So it is the byproduct of the untreated, unfinished businesses. What are you resisting? Are you resisting looking at it? It's not just dealing it, dealing with it. If you're looking at it and seeing it for what it is and what it costs you, and if you can get yourself more to that position, I don't know how I'm going to fix this, but I know that this is not the way I want to live. It costs me. I carry it with me every day. All right. It just weighs me down. And I want to do something. What do you need to do? What form of psychoeducation? This, that's why I do this podcast. All right. That's why I wrote the book. Um, that's why I did the audio book for people who don't like to sit and read. <clears throat> that's why a lot of people, maybe, maybe one of the issues that needs to be addressed first isn't the build up, the clutter, the hoarding, depending on where on the continuum you are. It does need dealing with. I have news for you, all right, because it will continue to develop, not like it fixes itself. And, but is there some other issue that is a stumbling block for you? There were a list of 14 comorbidities, coexisting conditions, like hoarding wasn't bad enough. All right. And do they cause hoarding? No, they don't cause hoarding or, or clutter. They don't. But they do make it more difficult to do the work. So what is it right now, as you look around you, all right, where you are, just with respect to clutter, because generally that's what uh, people who are attending here are struggling with to some degree. Um, what, if you just took the clutter and set it aside to the, the right a little bit, is there another issue that also needs reinforcement, work, and support? And if it is, name it now on your paper. Name it now. All right? I'm going to give you a minute because I'm going to trust that all of you have pens and papers. <laughs> And all of you are writing frantically right now. Okay. What would that issue be? Got a pretty good idea? If you don't know, you don't have a sense of it, write this down. Feels like, fill in the blank. I don't know what it is, but it feels like. And maybe you're just going to describe a sensory experience you have or a part of your body reacting in a certain way it feels like a clenched stomach it feels like a load on my shoulders it feels like a headache it feels like and let's track it back from there because those bodily sensations are not random they are also trying they are also trying to tell you something your body your mind and your spirit are always trying to heal you, always.
they're on your team. And if you feel that you've got too many issues, pick any one because any one that you work on automatically helps support doing better with the others. And nobody in this life gets into it or out of it with just one issue. You're not alone. All right. Okay. So no matter how successful you are or were, these felt senses persist. And quite often, they persist as insecurity, a lack of self-esteem, enough self-esteem, nothing's 100%, or some degree of knee-jerking to shame when you're not perfect or when you think you're not right or when it's proved to you. You're so far off right, you might as well be left. All right, whatever that is. Nor does it typically respond to verbal persuasion, which is why what I'm saying right now will be a motivating factor, but it's not enough. You need to name it because it belongs to you. You need to say where you feel it, what it feels like. And attempts by you or others to just talk about it is all interesting. And it can be an important part of the healing process. But it's not going to get the job done. You, there are no answers that you don't already know inside yourself. My whole counseling belief is my job is to help you find the answers that are already inside you, but you have them stuffed down. Your own truths, you are stuffing down with things that get in the way that keep them down. And sometimes that's clutter. And sometimes even to the degree of hoarding. And sometimes it's other things as well. Healing shame, healing that knee-jerk lack of self-esteem is in part helped by verbal, but it, it is more about dealing with it from your heart. If your heart, and I'm not talking about the organ, I, I'm talking about your personal energy source, if you get in touch with that, that thing that is your essential, your heart is, is the symbol we have for it. If you deal with it from your heart and tell yourself the raw truth and we work from there, that's a winning combination. All right. So we will do that a little bit in that uh, workshop on the 26th and we will do more of that in a longer series workshop sometime probably starting the end of April. It probably will be about an eight-week uh, workshop course there. All right, so stay tuned for that if this is something you feel you need. Know this, write this word down. Neuro, N-E-U-R-O, plasticity. Neuroplasticity. And you know what that is? That is something we all have. So I don't want to hear any I can't. I want to hear, I don't know how to do this. I'm not, I, I'm not, I just don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. But you know what? If you're gentle with me and you respect the fact I have my own answers and I have my own needs, I'll follow along and I will do my job by taking responsibility for doing the work I need to do for me. All right. So um, let me just see if there's anything. Else. And of course, we will be working on skill development. 
because we need something to replace the default behaviors that are based on that sensory, nonverbal ghost that, or echo, let's call it an echo, an echo from the past, All right? Because remember, these things that are true from the past, that still in some form exist within us, they are an echo. It's sort of like a star. By the time you see it, it went out how many million years ago? It's no longer there. The echo from the past, it's no longer there. It's an echo, 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 echo. So let's quiet, 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 quiet. Let's turn down the volume and let's increase the music. All right. Let's increase the music that is more motivational that part of ourself that energizes ourselves. And also, even though we hold ourselves responsible, even though we accept blame, responsibility for the things we've done, we also value ourselves. We also value ourselves. All right. Okay, everyone. I've got 53 chat things. Let me have a little look. Let me have a little look here. All right. <laughs> it's true. Um, Christine says to everyone, my nieces and nephews love when I point out a star whose light left that star before we were born. It's an amazing, it, it is amazing. All right, where am I here now? All right, now. Um, I'm going to go to the top because I can't do it otherwise. Yes, my secret shame rituals and privacy around them. So if you have um, a shame ritual and it keeps you where you are, in some way it's penance that you're paying off. No, there's no paying off. There is making it as right as you possibly can. And as I learned, Miss Grumpy Guts here, um, as I learned, I don't want the feeling of regret, all right? I don't want to carry that around on my shoulders, just nagging at me, well, that was your best move. Um, like, who do you think you are to bite somebody's head off? <laughs> All the little messages, all right? I don't want that. And so the next time, I will try better. I will make a commitment. Will I be better? Time will tell. How much have I learned? How much have I learned and how much do I want it? Okay. Reparenting, yes. Yes. Um, let me have a look. Um, Alina, thanks, Hafsa. Good. Uh, you said it happens up to 18 months, secure and secure. That's the critical point, Christine. Um, now, the legacy of that lives on. All right. And now it gets words. Now it gets actions because the other part of our brain is now developing. And now we have a capacity to put memories into it, to put um, physical actions, sensory uh, reactions inside sensory responses so it becomes more complicated a deeper richer negative feeling or a deeper richer positive feeling okay. oh i didn't know that so with your um when the screen is jumping, apparently, Christine says, um, that is a Zoom update glitch. It was quite funny, actually, yesterday, um, that two members on the tribunal panel, um, there we were on Zoom, their computers went offline. And uh, they didn't go at the same time. And I was wondering what was happening. 
hoping it, it didn't happen to me. And I'm wondering whether it is part of an update glitch. Okay, it optimizes video quality with denoise is checked, uncheck it. Hafsa, can you do that? Optimize video quality with denoise is checked, uncheck it. Okay. Um, so many issues, not sure where there's enough paper. Just pick one. Just pick one and it will have a ripple effect. And then you realize, pick an easy one. Okay, start with an easy one because then you know you can do it. Okay. Thank you for letting, okay. Thank you for letting me know, Carrie. Um, finally realized the shame was the problem. The problem was the emotional pain, the shame. Yes. Put the shame to bed, however. Put the shame to bed, all right? Because the power of habituation over the number of years that that is a place you've gone to or it it jumped up and, you know, like a boogeyman scared you. Um, that also, the, the habituation process is something you need to outweigh another way. Let me see. Okay, Sherry. And so, um, interesting comment. Um, maybe one of the things that that particular experience um, repeats itself, and I'm not saying you're repeating it, I'm saying that if that is as a result or, or the legacy of um, an adverse childhood experience, then you can see how you are more susceptible to interpreting things in a way or reacting in a way that repeats the pattern. All right. And I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying we can't make happen what we're not aware of. All right. And sometimes we see things in a patterned way. We interpret things in a patterned way. And that can influence uh, the takeaway learning that we have. Okay. All right. So I will see you next Wednesday. And uh, remember the, I think I said the 15th for registration and the 18th for whatever amount you want to contribute as your piece for that three hour workshop. I look forward to seeing you. Take care and we'll see you next week. Bye bye everybody. Can you do it? Yes you can. Yes you can.